Well, uh, first of all, thank you again, uh, Sarah, for the wonderful introduction, and uh, congratulations again to this year's awards winner, award winners. It's a fantastic achievement. Um, I would add one final thanks to Sarah for pointing out that the title does have a pun in it, um, which I will repeat later, but I was worried people up front might not realize it, so um, we will get to that. <laughs> This next exploration of numbers in different languages and cultures will take us thousands of miles westward to South America. Uh, it will also invite us to consider a distinctly three-dimensional way of recording information. The name for this as-of-yet undeciphered recording device, which will be the subject of my talk today, is the Kipu, a knotted string register that fulfilled the functions of writing during the Inca Empire between 1400 and 1532 AD. Indeed, the Incas, whose territories at their height stretched some 4,000 kilometers along the spine of the Andes Mountains, from Ecuador and Colombia in the north to Chile, Bolivia, and, and parts of Argentina in the south, relied on quipus for the administration of a population often estimated at greater than 10 million uh, from Cusco, their capital, which is marked in red on the map. A class of cord keepers called quipu camayacs maintained accounts of relative information for the exercise of Inca power rendering the empire, by all measures, the largest civilization of the pre-Columbian Americas. However, among my goals well, here will be to demonstrate that this is not the whole story, uh, to dispel some common misconceptions about when quipus were used, what they looked like, and what type of information they recorded. This will go hand in hand with an assessment of where we stand with, our, with regard to our understanding of their mathematical properties. So, um, after introducing you to the structure of a quipu, I will divide the remainder of the talk into two parts. The first, focusing on mathematical aspects of what I will term archaeological quipus, by which I mean quipus for which we possess detailed provenience, or information about their locations and contexts of discovery. In contrast, the second set of case studies will focus on what I call decontextualized quipus, uh, examples often found in museums and private collections around the world that lack this same information. Finally, I'll conclude with some reflections on the path forward in quipu decipherment, focusing on a set of questions facing those who seek to better understand Andean mathematical practices. So first on chronology. Um, for how often quipus are associated with the Incas, it may come as a surprise that quipus were not an Inca invention. The earlier Wari polity of the South Central Andes produced the earliest quipus currently recognized by the broader academic community, leveraging them for their own internal administration. Quipu use would also continue following the Spanish conquest of the Incas from 1532 onward, as various colonial actors queried Indian cord keepers to obtain demographic and other information soon after their arrival. Cord keeping would persist for centuries more, in fact, yielding a current estimate of about 1,000 years, or roughly from 950 to 1950 AD, for the minimum period of active quipu use in the Andes. For the purposes of this talk, uh, suffice it to say that while quipu use reached its apex during Inca times, this represents less than 15% of its suspected functional lifespan. Given the significant variation in quipus during this interval, here I will only focus on a specific subset of the many quipu traditions, uh, which I will describe using the synonymous terms canonical and Inca-style quipu. Canonical because quipus of the general structure shown in the diagram on the screen have become the prototypical image of a quipu, quipu in the popular imagination. And Inca style because many quipus with this structure have been radiocarbon dated to the Inca period. An Inca style quipu consists of a thick horizontal primary cord from which hang between one and over 1,000 thinner pendant cords. Vertical top cords may emanate in a direction opposite to the pendant cords, sometimes recording the sum of the numbers knotted in the associated hanging pendants. Both pendant and top cords can also have attached subsidiary cords, which sometimes have their own subsubsidiary cords, and so on. However, only one element gives a quipu its name, its knots. Quipu means knot in Quechua, which is a major Indian language. With these knots arranged in horizontal levels, like in this diagram, uh, a quipu registered the number one with a so-called figure eight knot, the values two through nine with a so-called long knot of the corresponding number of turns, and place values of 10 or higher, which were tied closer to the top of the cord or the top of your screen, um, with simple overhand knots. As far as we know, the Incas lacked a unique sign for zero, other than to leave the corresponding cord or place value blank, uh, that is, unknotted. Each hanging pendant cord commonly registered a single numerical value, which could allow us to think of the lower bound of an Inca style uh, quipu's contents as a collection of numbers. And yet, since the early 20th century, numerical knots are the only element of a quipu that can be reliably interpreted across most of the Inca-style examples. A Brooklyn-based historian of mathematics named Leland Locke, 
himself a collector of historical calculating instruments, deciphered the meaning of the three types of knots on the previous slide, publishing the result in 1912. In studying the dozens of kipus in the collections of the American Museum of Natural History in Manhattan, uh, he uncovered one in which the top chord's numerical values equal to the sum of the values registered on the individual pendant chords through which each was interlaced. So in the example on the screen, the top chord that emanates upward would record the sum of the values not on each of the pendants that it is interlaced through. Locke has been uh, likened by some kipu researchers to Champollion of hieroglyphic fame for this same reason, though of course here, uh, in our case, much remains to be deciphered. In the century of study since the work of Locke, um, and in keeping with the wordplay that gives this talk its title, um, it has become ever clearer that a kipu is not just numbers. Uh, we have identified variation in the spin and ply of each pendant cord, which refers to the direction in which the fibers are twisted and retwisted, uh, with an axis oriented either like the backbone of a capital S or Z, in long knot directionality, with the backbone of each either Z or S oriented again, and in attachment knot direction, such that each pendant cord is attached to the horizontal primary cord in either a recto or verso fashion, among others. Further expanding this complexity is Akipu's colors, which are often many. The color chart displayed on this slide, for example, includes over 60 potential options for Inca-style cord colors, all of which can appear in various combinations and schemas. In my own research in museums, I've seen cords that are solid colors, some that change colors, and others, for example, arranged similar to a barber pole with two colors that alternate in a stacked fashion. Kipu users would have been able to convey meaning from running their hands along the cords, aided by the kipu's own internal spatial and tactile relationships, but exactly how they did so, unfortunately, remains unclear. Crucially, this is not to say that all these elements were in use at the same time on every kipu of this style, nor is it to suggest that these are all reliably data-bearing loci. Some variation between different kipus may ultimately be revealed to be idiosyncratic. Uh, but it will hopefully serve us as we now move to discuss kipus with particularly notable properties, uh, which given our current state of knowledge has often taken the form of identifying particularly striking mathematical relationships. The first examples of these are to be found in what I've termed archeological kipus. Now recall that archeological kipus are here taken to mean those through which we have clear provenience. The picture on the screen, for example, shows a cache of kipus recovered from a deerskin pouch at Pachacamac, a pre-Hispanic coastal pilgrimage site south of Lima in 1976. These kipus have been posited as potentially recording information relevant to local ritual offerings, given the broader context of the site, Pachacamac, uh, to which they pertain. Similarly, in the following two case studies, knowledge of the location of discovery has aided efforts in interpreting the meaning of the kipus' specific mathematical properties. But what subset of mathematical practice is reflected in each? Uh, two types will be discussed here. Uh, the first, called hierarchically ranked sums across kipus, or, or in my terms, vertical summation, um, as well, uh, the second being arithmetic relevant to accounting. So the first example. Just to the northeast of Lima, on the bank of the Rimac River, lies the archeological site of Puruchuco, uh, which is thought to have served as a center of local Inca administration. Some 60 years ago, a team excavating the site discovered an urn under the floor of a small building, which enclosed within it over 20 relatively well-preserved kipus of various sizes. Six of these kipus have informed an analysis to the right, on the right side of the screen, and published most recently by Carrie Brzezin and Luis Felipe Villacorta, that demonstrates a type of vertical aggregation and partitioning that organizes the kipus into a three-level hierarchy. The kipus grouped at each horizontal level of the hierarchy also demonstrate identical or closely matching numerical values and color patterning, which may have served as a possible checks and balances mechanism. Now, what we seem to be seeing here is a manifestation of how information was transmitted within the Inca era administrative hierarchy. In short, numerical values from local accounts, level one, which is shown at the bottom of the right hand of the screen, would have been summed within level two kipus, the middle row, which themselves would have been synthesized in the higher ordered level three kipus that were transmitted regionally, and that is potentially outside of Puruchuco itself. Certain knots toward the left-hand sides of the level two and level three kipus on this diagram have even been described as possible non-numerical place identifiers for the word Puruchuco, which may have allowed for the identification of the kipus with this location. Now, as for the more specific conditions of the use of these kipus, Carol Mackey hypothesized in her study of the cache that the cords belonged to a kipu master who lived near the main palace at the site. If so, such an individual in all likelihood uh, would have inter interfaced with higher ranking Inca overseers, a conclusion that the study of other archives of Inca kipus will allow for us to evaluate further. 
The second example uh, takes us further south along the Peruvian coast to the Cañete Valley. It is here that we find the site of Inca Huasi, which per the Spanish chroniclers is said to have been a staging area for Inca military campaigns. Its associated storehouse facilities have also been the source of dozens of the most recently excavated archeological quipus. Specifically, in the 2013 to 2014 field season, the Peruvian archeologist Alejandro Chu recovered a total of 34 quipus from the storage area designated Sector A. These have been hypothesized to be records of the receipt and storage of goods arriving at the site, uh, an interpretation supported by the context of their discovery. Several of the excavated quipus were found in direct association with food crops, including chili peppers, black beans, and peanuts. I will focus briefly on two of these quipus, numbered 267A and 267B, a picture of which is in the upper right corner of the screen. In both of these quipus, uh, the numerical excerpt only from quipu 267A is used here for reference uh, in the enlarged image, a repeating sequence of apparently arithmetic operations is registered in three chord sequences of the form y minus n equals x, where n is the constant value 15. So for example, we see in chords number 11, 12, and 13 in the enlarged image uh, of quipu 267A, the sequence 206 minus 15 equals 191. In addition, two other quipus found in close proximity to uh, the ones you see the picture of register many of the same numerical values, uh, but instead using the inverted form y minus x equals n, with the fixed n recorded as a repeating result. Now two phenomena seem to be at play. Um, the first is the recording of arithmetic relevant to an Inca accounting context. There has been disagreement regarding what the fixed values of 15 mean, uh, with proposals of everything from a tax on incoming products to support Inkawasi's managing personnel to a fixed amount of seed set aside for planting. Um, but in any case, these quipus hint at the types of numerical operations that would have been relevant to the maintenance of a, a storehouse uh, facility uh, like this one. The second property is that of the paired or matching quipus. The repetition of values in complementary arrangements, that is the apparent recording of y minus n equals x on some quipus, but y minus x equals n on others, has been explored by John Clint Daniel in his doctoral research as a physical manifestation of net credit and net debit calculations. And a new set of 23 quipus discovered in sector B at Inkawasi by Clint Daniel and Chu in 2016, uh, which sometimes record much larger numerical values, uh, will hopefully be instructive in forming more specific statements about accounting practices at Inkawasi going forward. Now, the second set of case studies I'll cover in this talk pertains to what I have termed decontextualized quipus, uh, examples of quipus for which we lack specific information about provenience. Our ability to discuss these quipus is in large part thanks to the work of previous scholars who called for and implemented their large-scale cataloging in museums and private collections. A brief survey of these activities will help in contextualizing uh, what comes next. In 1897, the German archaeologist Max Ule, a foundational figure in the development of Peruvian archaeology, wrote in his report on a modern quipu used near Lake Titicaca that museums possessing quipus ought to publish them. We would then clearly see what details remain to be explained, Ule suggested, such that further inquiries could be proceeded with accordingly. The ensuing decades would witness a moderate, albeit patchy, response to Ule's call. Leland Locke, who was mentioned earlier, published a book in 1923 which included a preliminary inventory listing the locations of over 40 quipus in Peru, England, France, Germany, and the United States. Erland Nordenskjold, a Swedish archaeologist, published two studies in 1925 claiming that repetitions of the number seven in a small sample of quipus were proof of their magical nature, both as defenses against evil spirits and registers of the synodic orbits of Venus and Mercury. However, more serious investigations would also emerge. Um, they would often yield photographs like this one taken by an Argentinian researcher in 1937 uh, that are sometimes the last known images of individual specimens, which have since been lost or otherwise consigned to obscurity. However, to do justice to the large-scale cataloging of quipus will require paying homage to Marcia Asher and Robert Asher. She an Ithaca College mathematician and he a Cornell anthropologist who throughout the 1970s and 1980s grew the known inventory of quipus in worldwide collections from just over 70 to about 400 examples. In the photographs on the screen, you can see them both holding one of the largest quipus ever found, um, originally discovered by a Chilean archeologist named Percy Dahlsberg in Chile's dry north. Now the fruits of the Asher's labor in this regard would be two massive data books with chord by chord descriptions of over 200 quipus using the general form that's shown on the slide. Careful measurements were taken of everything from the quipus colors to the groupings of pendant chords to information about the lengths, numerical values, and subsidiaries of individual pendant strings. 
Each quipu's entry was supplemented with observations about its notable mathematical properties, if any, and, and these mathematical relations, as the Ashers called them, will be revisited uh, in due course. Without a doubt, the move toward the digital cataloging of quipus in the ensuing decades has drawn inspiration from the Ashers' persistence. Other quipu researchers, myself included, have recorded data later incorporated into various database projects hosted in both Peru and the United States. The largest database, which was designed and implemented by Kerry Brzeen, an American mathematician and weaver in 2002, is today maintained by the University of Chicago, um, at that university by the American archaeologist John Clendaniel. Of course, not all quipus in museum storage depots are complete or mounted for public viewing. Detached or otherwise fragmentary cordage often accompanies a museum's quipus, which, given its often tangled and fragile state, like in the examples here, uh, sometimes precludes its cataloging and digitization. However, for hundreds of quipus more, researchers have been able to log their locations. As part of a new book on the state of quipu studies that has come out just last week, um, I've prepared a comprehensive survey of quipu cataloging efforts over the last 100 years, which is summarized in this graph on the screen. Um, the solid line here, and we'll see it repeat a couple of times, um, represents the aggregate number of quipus inventoried in museums and private collections over the last century, while the dashed line, which appears uh, closer to the present day, shows the number of those quipus that have been digitized and entered into an existing database project. You'll notice the dashed line begins in 2002, coinciding uh, with the creation of the first quipu database. This effort has raised the known total of quipus in global collections to at least 1,386, with 866 of these maintained digitally in an existing database. This new estimate represents a 50% increase in the global inventory of quipus since the last attempt published just a few years ago. These updated data can then serve as inputs to different types of visualizations, um, including this one, which is a dynamic map of historical quipu cataloging efforts in Europe. Um, and so as this cycles through, I would just encourage you to look at um, each one of the appearing blue um, columns there is showing you over time the discovery and then recording, cataloging, and, and publication uh, of quipus in museums uh, throughout Europe. And uh, I've done the same thing here for, um, for South America and for North America as well, but for the sake of time, we'll just look at Europe here. And as it plays one more time, uh, you'll notice in just a few years here, the work of the Ashers pops up, and there goes Berlin. Um, all of the other European museums, we have found, uh, and I've come across them in dozens. Um, and, and most of these, by the way, uh, are maybe not most, but many of these a researcher has not visited yet to catalog the quipus. So this is really step one, and to inventory the quipus in the collection. And once the necessary funds arise, uh, one of the researchers who works on quipus will visit one of these places and, and, and record each quipus uh, information, which is subsequently um, entered digitally and, and someday entered into a database project. Um, here is also a dynamic map of these cataloging efforts, uh, sorry, a static map uh, showing where we stand. So this includes the European collection as well as uh, the North and South American ones that I had mentioned. With that, in the following three short case studies, I will survey some of the work that my predecessors and I have been conducting on decontextualized quipus, including the identification of mathematical relationships, seemingly geometric information, and possible Rosetta quipus, that is, quipus that correspond to a surviving written source. The first of these, which you see on this slide, is what Marsh and Robert Asher called a quipu's mathematical relations, which fill the pages of those large data books that they created in the 70s and 80s. Take for just one brief example, and the following quipus in the collections of the Berlin Ethnological Museum. Um, I will focus here on it, the first six groups of this single quipu, uh, which are highlighted on the screen, each of which has 10 pendant cords. And so 10 pendant cords in each group times the six group yields 60 total pendant cords under consideration here. Three properties are apparent in the highlighted area, as first noted by the Ashers. First, the 60 pendant cords consist of repetitions of only four numerical values, 11, 12, 20, and 21. Second, the sum of the 60 pendant cords, correcting for one missing pendant, is exactly 1,000. And third, when the pendants are added by their index, that is, pendant one and group one, added to pendant one and group two, added to pendant one and group three, all the way through pendant one and group six, each sum within a range of plus or minus one corresponds to a simple, or each sum, sorry, corresponds to a simple fractional part of 1,000. The list of those 10 fractions, each corresponding to one index in the 10 pendant sized chord groups, is shown on the screen. The simplicity of the fractions in the Asher's view can be plausibly interpreted as a trace of intentional decisions by Kipu makers. The Ashers would go on to identify even more complex properties. 
Toward the end of the 1981 book in which they reported their findings, the Ashers concluded that the body of arithmetic, arithmetic ideas used by the Incas included, quote, at a minimum, addition, division into um, equal parts, division into simple, unequal fractional parts, division into proportional parts, multiplication of integers by integers, and multiplication of integers by fractions, end quote. The years to come will be important in evaluating the plausibility of each of these claims. Now, a second instance of mathematical properties that I will cover here is reported in the work of, of a Peruvian engineer and statistician named Hugo Pereira Sanchez. In 1996, Pereira analyzed two quipus supposedly from Peru's southern coast, but deposited in the Berlin Museum in 1907. The Ashers had examined these two quipus in the 1970s and had numbered them 120 and 143. In their initial study of these two quipus, the Ashers noted three striking properties. The first being that in both quipus, each pendant chord in its first group on the left registers the sum of the corresponding chord index in several subsequent groups. That is, in these quipus, pendant one in group one is equal to the sum of the first pendants in groups two, three, four, etc. Pendant two in group one is then equal to the sum of the second pendants in groups two, three, four, etc. Um, in quipu 120 specifically, the ratios of the associated values are consistent within about 1% of deviation. That is, chord two in group two divided by chord two in group one equals about 0.34, Chord three in group two divided by chord three in group one equals about 0 0.43 and so on. Finally, one pendant chord in Kipu 143 recording the value 97,357 was posited to be the largest single value on any of the Kipus the Ashers had studied. Now let's focus on Kipu 120 for a moment. The numerical values for each of its four groups of chords are shown in the table, with each row written in the order of the chords in each group. That is, each row is one of the chord groups, and then the order of the cells in each of that, uh, going from left to right, represents the order of the chords. What Pereira noticed was that the constant ratios between pendant chords are not just limited to the pairs of groups the Ashers had identified, but in fact, the quotient of any two groups of chords in this kipu produces a constant ratio. Most strikingly, the correlation coefficient for any pair of chord groups in this kipu, that is, of any two rows of that table, is almost exactly one. They produce a near-perfect linear relationship. Pereira even pr produced a geometric model in which the slopes of these regression lines could implicitly define the interior angles of similar right triangles, with the lengths of the legs defined by the values knotted on each pendant chord and the corresponding sum of the indexed pendant values. So what are we to think of this property? Um, were quipus used in the pre-Columbian or colonial Andes for the measurement of geometric or angular information? At least one other scholar of whom I am aware has suggested the possibility that quipus recorded proportional ratios relevant to building construction, um, but it has been the contention of my own research that we will ultimately need to analyze a larger sample to search for, for numerical properties on a grand scale. The third and final usage of numerical kipu information that I will discuss here is the possibility of finding correspondences between existing kipus and surviving written sources, raising the possibility of a so-called Rosetta kipu. In theory, most any Inca-style kipu might be a plausible candidate for correlation with a written source. Currently, written numerical records from after the conquest remain our clearest entry point to searching for exact correspondences. And in a subset of these documents, we even know the information to have been derived directly from one or more kipus. Such kipu transcriptions, or paper kipus as they're sometimes called, are among the most striking creations of intercultural encounter in the early colonial Americas. Recall that from the early years of the conquest, Spanish overseers elicited information from native Andean court keepers in various settings. During the associated kipu readings, an Andean court keeper would vocalize the contents of one or more kipus, an interpreter would translate the rendering in Quechua or Aymara to Spanish, and a scribe would record the result. The surviving kipu transcriptions, most of which pertain to the legal sphere, are often extremely complex. Perhaps the most famous examples registered as part of a 1560s proof of merit claim lodged by the Central Andean Huanca ethnic group enumerate over a decade of transfers to various Spanish visitors to their communities. These included everything from camelids to salt, fish, and maize beer called chicha. For many goods in the account, the Huanca court keepers even distinguished between the goods that were delivered to the Spanish uh, visitors and then those that were pillaged or stolen by them. Now how such a binary distinction would or could have been noted in the original knotted accounts is unclear, uh, though we might be tempted to speculate that this was indicated by some binary aspect of the kipus in question, like spin and ply or attachment knot, uh, though of course other elements are possible. 
We are fortunate, thanks to the efforts of previous scholars to transcribe archival documents, to have access to published versions of many Kibu transcriptions, the largest of which being a corpus compiled by Marty Parsonen and Yuka Kibi Harju. My recent research on this corpus has involved digitizing about 10,000 lines of Kibu transcriptions as originally penned and encoding the results in a machine-readable markup language called XML. In addition to enabling detailed linguistic studies of Kipu transcriptions, these digitized texts, like the digitized Kipus, allow us to visualize them in novel ways. For example, the map on this slide is the corollary to the maps of Kipu locations and museums and other collections uh, that I have already shown earlier. Um, in this case, we see the locations described in 72 Kipu transcriptions, grouped by the number of transcriptions per place. These represent a great variety of areas and climatic zones, um, which is in contrast to the overwhelmingly coastal concentration of kipus with known origins. In addition, the numbers registered in kipu transcriptions represent, as of today, the clearest point of intersection in the search for potential kipu document matches, however defined. Um, in this regard, I would highlight a fantastic analysis by Kerry Brzezine, who has used computational methods to compare the distributions of numerical values in extant kipu samples to those of household-level census figures that were recorded following the conquest. Brzezine's analysis, some examples of which you can see on the screen, takes as its input several known census documents, each of which listing the number of members of each household surveyed in each location, and treats them as exemplars or templates for the identification of kipus with similar collections of numbers. Subsequent statistical testing revealed a handful of kipus whose numerical distributions are strikingly similar to those contained in the censuses, enabling their provisional classification as demographic kipus. The analysis has even identified certain decontextualized kipus as plausible registers of demographic decline in, in the decades following the Spanish conquest. Increasingly, it seems that to speak of a so-called time series kipu uh, may someday emerge as a realistic possibility. With that, uh, I hope that this introductory survey has served as a crash course of sorts in, in the mathematical practices of users of Inca-style kipus. We have taken account of various kipu traditions, dispelling the myth of the kipu as an Inca invention, and considering its 1,000-year-plus lifespan of active use. A series of case studies have zoomed in on practices from summation and partitioning and arithmetic at Puruchuco and Incahuasi in the case of archaeological kipus to the more abstract multiplicative and even potentially geometric um, relations observed among de decontextualized kipus. Finally, we zoomed out to examine searches for potential Rosetta kipus among almost 1,400 extant samples. So where does this all leave us? By way of conclusion, I will uh, introduce three questions that remain little treated in the field, but that might nonetheless serve Kipu decipherment efforts going forward. The first of these is, did Kipus record fractions, and if so, how? The Ashers claim not to have found evidence for fractional values represented on Kipus. However, early colonial transcriptions of Kipus sometimes note half units of various items reported by Andean informants. Um, for example, seven and one half loads of quinoa. Now, assuming that the canonical base 10 knot system was in use in the corresponding Kipus, how might such quantities have been registered originally, if at all? Were halves or other non-integer values signed by specific knot arrangements, or were other elements of the kipu used to distinguish them? A clearer understanding of fractional values may help to reveal aspects of the decimal numerical knots that enabled more complexity than otherwise thought. The second of these questions is, what were the largest numbers recorded on kipus? And we cannot state with certainty even the largest order of magnitude recorded at the apex of pre-Hispanic kipu use. Among extant samples, numbers as large as the hundreds of thousands have before been identified, which you'll notice is higher than the 97,000 number the Ashers had noted in their study in the 70s. Um, these are quantities that fall in line with some of the largest groupings of people subject to the Inca's administ administrative structure, I would add. Um, but we have to remember that Kipus recorded information about more than just people, um, including accounts of staple goods, for example, that were amassed in highly variable quantities. Frank Solomon has identified a quantity of over one million fish which members of a central Andean village reported having given to their curate around the turn of the 17th century, for instance. Important work in this realm has been done by Sabina Highland, and she has proposed a decipherment of two types of color patterning on kipus, with one pattern corresponding to individual level data and the other to aggregate figures. John Clendaniel has since found Highland's decipherment of color patterning to hold relatively well across hundreds of digitized examples, though these patterns will need to be assessed across different types of registered information. The third and final question is, what is the role of redundancy in Kipu recording? This question is the least well-formed of the three, but it is a profoundly important one, uh, in my opinion, for understanding numerical Kipus going forward. In short, certain aspects of Inca-style Kipus have been shown to provide seemingly duplicative information. 
For example, I have before observed kipus in museums with colors arranged in bands. Uh, that is, six light brown pendant cords followed by six dark brown pendant cords and so on. Um, however, these same bands of, co of cords are already set off from each other by spacing along the kipu's primary cord. In these cases, then, are the colors serving a purpose beyond mere visual embellishment? Um, if not, should they be considered redundant design decisions? Are they recording entirely different categories of information? A firmer footing with regard to redundancy might allow us to assess the interdependency of various kipu signs. To move beyond interpreting a decontextualized kipu as a simple collection of elements to instead reading it uh, as a script with its own rules, with a grammar, uh, as John Clay Daniel has referred to it. The anthropologist Denise Arnold has before raised the possibility of Inca style kipus as a quote, mathematics incarnate. Arnold used the word primarily in its strict etymological sense, documenting correlations between a kipu's components and human anatomy. However, I think it provides an impressively succinct way for describing an even larger sphere of meaning making in the Andes. For kipus were as much registers of numbers as they were dynamic accounts of the administrative and social environments in which those same numbers operated. As far as I see it, we would be justified in considering them, to repeat the subtitle of this talk, knotted instruments of mathematics and more. Um, thanks, and with that, I'll take any questions. First question here. Um, with respect, this is from Evan Binkley. With respect to decontextualize these partial kipus, is it still possible to gain accurate information, or is it necessary to have a kipu in its entirety in order to hmm. know what it's saying? Yeah, it's a good question, certainly. Decontextualized in the way I've used it in the talk is simply to refer to kipus that, uh, for which we do not have detailed information or pictures, for example, of the moment it was discovered and its location. Um, certainly, some of the kipus from those archaeological contexts can also be fragmentary, uh, right? So half of the pendants might have broken off in the hundred of years, hundreds of years it, it has been underground or in the sand or wherever it is found. Um, with those fragmentary kipus, it is difficult, to say the least. Um, but I would say it depends in step with the amount of the kipu that remains. And so some of the mathematical relations that the Ashers had identified in their studies were found in kipus that were fragmentary, or in other cases in kipus that, uh, while complete, only had maybe 10 or 15 pendant cords. And so I, I would like to think, and perhaps optimistically, I'm quite biased, uh, that even fragmentary kipus represent a a promising path forward. Um, and it, I would add just as a final footnote there that there's been debate in the field about whether we should even examine fragmentary kipus and, and whether there is a, a, a threshold, let's say, um, after which a kipu is too small or too fragmentary to study. Sometimes it's too tangled to untangle safely without it um, falling apart. Um, but uh, again, this is influenced by my own optimistic opinion that we do have a path forward with kipus that are not complete. OK, thank you. Um, I really like this question. If you could talk to someone from the period, says Ken Edwards, who understood all about kipus, what one question, you get one question, what one question would you, would you get them to answer? Well, there is a genie in the bottle at the Museum of London. Um, the one question I would ask a kipu user of the pre-Hispanic period is whether kipus were a conventionalized system. Um, and I'll elaborate on that. I, I wouldn't for the Kipu Kamayak, they would presumably know what that question means, um, but for all of us here, um, that is a debate that has, uh, has taken part over, that, that has taken place over the last century of, which really represents the history of academic Kipu studies, is whether when we look at a Kipu, it was part of a larger conventionalized system of meaning making. That is, did it have, to use the word grammar that John Clay Daniel used, certain sets of rules um, and, and limitations on the types of recording uh, and the types of signs that could be placed on the same string. And if the answer to that question is yes, then our decipherment pathway, we, can, we have grounds to be very optimistic about it in the same way that the Rosetta Stone unlocked the hieroglyphic mystery. And finding a kipu that matches, a, kipu that matches a, a written document would in turn allow us to infer characteristics of many other kipus and based on our supposition that they were part and parcel of the same system of signs. If in contrast, a kipu was not to be considered a, a conventionalized sign system uh, or only partially pockmarked, whatever you want to call it, and then our focus in our decipherment efforts will have to be, uh, will have to be um, constrained by various aspects of Andean economic life um, and, and the Andean world. And so I would just add there to finish this answer that in the Inca Wasi context, 
And Clint Daniels' doctoral research has revealed aspects of those kipus, uh, for example, in their color patterning, and that is actually correlated with the arithmetic operations that happens within it. Um, and so as he writes in his thesis, the first chord, if you might recall, corresponded to addition in the three chord sequences. The second one was subtraction. And then the final one was the result. Um, the colors on those three chord sequences were quite striking because the first chord was a light color, the second chord was a dark color, and the third chord, registering the result, was actually a mixture of the previous two shades of colors. So we have a striking instance of correlation between colors and certain actions uh, that Akipu was presumably registering, but uh, it will only take time and, and effort to see whether such correlations hold true when we look at larger systems, or sorry, larger samples of, of Kipus in the corpus. Um, I want to ask, what are they made of? Like, what are their ropes actually made of? Because... You're right, and it's something I should have stated <laughs> right up front. Um, the majority of Inca-style kipus, so recall, that is the, those are the kipus that look like the diagram I showed you, that have the horizontal cord and then many that hang down from it. The vast majority that survive today are made of cotton. Um, we also have examples um, of kipus made from uh, vegetal fibers, so everything from uh, certain types of grasses to uh, uh, to to uh, parts of uh, forgetting the name right now. But for vegetal fibers, we also have examples uh, of individual pendants that are made of human hair. And, and so the basket of raw materials that was used by a kipu kamayak in, in forming their collection of kipus, uh, we have not settled on on its boundaries. Uh, we have not set the goalposts, so to speak, for uh, what materials a kipu kamayak would reach to in any given moment. And for the creation of kipus, um, but we can say that the vast majority are made of cotton, um, but we also have examples of vegetal fiber, and I should also add of animal fiber as well. And um, since we have a good number, not many, um, but kipu strings that are made of uh, the hair of uh, llamas and alpacas and other camelids native to the Andes. Um, the very last thing I'd add to this answer is that um, this statement, all these statements I've just made, are of course, of course should be circumscribed by the context of archaeological preservation. Right? So since the vast majority of kipus pertain to the coastal regions, because uh, the Atacama Desert is the, the driest desert on Earth, um, we do not know with certainty uh, what kipus in the highlands, that is, for example, in Cusco, the Inca capital, uh, were necessarily made of. And we can only suspect, since camelids are often herded at higher altitudes, uh, that many more kipus in the highlands would have uh, been made of animal fibers, or at least uh, would have had a, a sort of pot of resources of raw fiber from, from camelids to be able to put into them. And, but it just means that we have to put sort of an asterisk um, on any answer to the question of uh, what kipus were made of. Uh, we can certainly point to the ones that we have today with us, but we wish there were more. All the examples you've given of the, um, of the interpretation of the knots and their positions, uh, you've used a binary notation. Is there any evidence that the uh, kipus in other uh, number bases like um, octal or 12 or 16 or whatever? Hmm. It's a difficult question. Um, whether we know of kipus that were registering numerical values in, in other bases, and besides the, the base 10 system that the, uh, is, is most famously associated with the Incas, but again, I call Inca style. And the short answer is we suspect that other bases might have sometimes been in play. Um, the example I would point to is the Wari polity, uh, which you might remember on the, tr the graph, uh, the, the sort of 3D arrow that shows the different traditions of kipus. The one to the furthest, the furthest to the left, uh, the Wari, which are today recognized by the academic community as producing the, um, the earliest recognized kipus, at least. And I only say that because there's some debate as to whether uh, a, a several thousand year old um, knotted object from the site of Caral uh, constitutes a kipu. But putting that to the side, uh, Wari kipus look different than the ones I've shown you. I mean, I, I really didn't go into depth about them, but um, researchers early on in the history of, of those kipus have posited that, that Wari kipus used a mixture of base 2, 5, and 10 systems on the same kipu. Um, I would add, though, that in recent years, work by Jeffrey Splitstoser, who's the, the world's uh, foremost expert on these, has uh, pushed against that, that hypothesis. And his view, uh, at least as of his most recent writings, is that Wari Kipus also utilized a base 10 system, but potentially with a stronger binary component, um, where knots, unlike in Inca Kipus, could potentially have been used in Wari Kipus to record binary on-off type distinctions as well. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. It was really very thought-provoking. I have many questions, but I'm going to limit myself to one. Uh, you, could you say a bit more about the dynamical making of a kipu? For instance, you have a main chord. Do we have examples of main chords being extended? Or is it only one single chord to which uh, pendants are added? Because depending on the, the answer to this question, the notion of fragmentary kipu changes. Perhaps a fragmentary kipu is a kipu to which other kipus might be added by extension. So could you say a bit more about the dynamical making of these things? Of course. Um, in terms of the dynamics of making a kipu, I should say our first um, source whenever we have a question about how potentially kipus were used or made uh, is we go to the writings of the colonial chroniclers. Um, so these are often Spanish, sometimes mestizo writers who were writing their works in the first, uh, well, from the first decades following the conquest. And unfortunately, they do not give us any universal rules for how a kipu was made, or at least at its moment of making. So we have to look to the field of archaeology. Um, once we begin to look at archaeological kipus, um, and I would add at kipus in museums and collections, which sometimes are decontextualized, what we find is a wide variety um, of construction patterns, of, of, um, of morphologies. Uh, so for example, in museums, we have found kipus where, the, where more than one primary cord is actually tied together or sometimes interlaced. And can we call that two kipus? Can we call it one that was updated? Are they two parallel accounts of similar information? And we can't say with certainty. Other times we have found kipus where the pendant cords are entirely blank, that is unknotted. Presumably, and one can only hypothesize that that kipu is, is not just recording the number zero 37 times if there are 37 pendant cords on it. Um, but since there's not a unique sign for zero, that is, there's no knot in the canonical system that means zero, just the absence of a knot, uh, we are just left to hypothesize that that blank kipu might be like a blank Excel spreadsheet and before the user has inputted information into it. Um, the final thing I would add here is Frank Solomon is, the, uh, to my knowledge, one of the strongest proponents of the idea of a kipu as a, a mutable collection of things uh, or a mutable collection of elements. And Solomon has, in his work, in his ethnographic field work in a central Andean village called Tupicocha, where kipus are still used in an annual civic plenum, uh, that is, the incoming officers who are elected to lead the, the um, various um, uh, descendant groups of, of the community, a uh, kibu is draped over their shoulder once a year for the new incoming class, so to speak. Um, in his work there, he has posited the hypothesis that no, we should not, when we look at a kipu in a museum, think of it as a static register. Uh, we should not necessarily think of it as a final account uh, that was then placed in a jar somewhere to um, be kept for time indeterminate, um, but that many kipus would have been continually updated throughout the life, their active uh, lifespan. And, and unfortunately, absent a few examples of where we can see kinks in a cord for knots that presumably were unknotted, uh, which one scholar has called ghost knots, uh, which I think is a, a lovely term. And we just, I can't tell you for certain if we're in a museum and we're looking at a kipu where all the knots look like they conform to the canonical system, I would not be able to tell you by looking at it, at least not at our current stage, um, whether that kipu had any of its knots updated, whether it is a final account we are looking at, or actually whether it was a work in progress that was um, stopped due to external conditions. Um, you've talked about some of the uses perhaps for accounting, um, is there any implication um, or uses in the science of medicine? In medicine. Yeah. Medicine. The chronicles do not give us good information about potential uses of kipus with regard to medical practices um, during pre-Hispanic times. Uh, that has not stopped modern, I don't want to botch, scientists, I will use the more general term, from writing an article of potentially using a kipu wrapped around an arm to measure malnutrition. Um, but it is besides the point, um, just to say then that uh, the closest sphere, perhaps I would say, um, for which we suspect there, there were kipus used is the field of, of ritual action. Um, so we do have examples, and Sabina Highland has written about this, that since the pandemic struck, um, and Peru has of course been one of the countries worst affected by the pandemic on earth, so-called funerary kipus, or a single cord with knots tied into it um, that is tied around the waist of community members after they have passed away, um, that their usage has resurged during the pandemic. 
um, they are inter they they're, they're sort of intersect with with Catholic um, uh, with with, uh, with with Catholicism in the Andes, um, but. It is still at the level of a hypothesis to say that funerary kipus in the strict sense in which we see them among living people today in Peru were used um, during Inca, that is pre-Hispanic times. Um, uh, I would also add that we do have examples of burials with, with kipus uh, that are placed in direct association with the person who is buried. Uh, no one has yet written an article that surveys where uh, exactly in relation to the body all of those kipus have been placed in the history of archeological excavations. Um, but suffice it to say for the moment though that uh, the fact that many archeological kipus were discovered in graves really took, had a, a grasp over the field for decades. Um, if you had asked a keeper researcher in the 80s, even the Ashers, um, where do archeological kipus come from? They likely, and I don't want to speak for them, would have said that they all or most all come from graves. Um, today, with the example of Inkawasi that I spoke through about the uh, formula Y minus N equals X, we are beginning to find um, and, and are continuing to find many dozens of kipus in archeological contexts that aren't necessarily mortuary. Um, that storehouse, we, it has been suspected that those kipus recorded um, the, the receipt right, and depositing of, of products for the storehouse's operation at the, that military staging site. And um, so um, I would put all that together to say, while the chronicles do not tell us much about medical, potential medical um, uses, uh, we are certainly still at the point of hypothesis um, and hypothesis generation when it comes to the full range or genres, let's say, um, of kipus that were in use during pre-Hispanic times. Thanks, Manuel Mojano again for a fantastic talk. Thank you.